Yep, we're live. Thank you. Okay, uh, so welcome to round five. Um, so we'll do introductions. Um, we'll start with the judging panel, then go through side affirmative, side negative, and obviously a chance to provide pronouns if you so wish. Um, also, if you could just give me your speaking order as well when we do that. So my name's John, he, him pronouns. Okay, copy oh. their pronouns. Good luck, everyone. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No worries. Um, hi, my name is Palatino. He, they, all the best. Side affirmative. Hi there, I'm Oliver. I'm going to be speaking first in reply. Our second speaker is Sophie, and our third speaker is Daniel. Great. And side negative. Hello. Um, Naira going first. She heard they them. Hi, guys. Uh, Sajid going second in reply. Uh, no preferences. Sajid going third. No preferences. Great. Without any further ado, um, if there's any questions, we can get started with the first affirmative. So On you're... any given day, two people can leave the house. Those people can both have had the same amount of alcohol, get into very similar cars, go a very similar distance from their house, both with the full knowledge that what they do very well might end somebody else's life. One of those people, by random chance, could hit someone and kill them. Another of those people could, by random chance, not hit someone and not kill someone. And it's incredibly arbitrary that one of them caused harm and one of them did not. We would tell you that both individuals are morally culpable for harm or the potentiality of harm occurring, and both individuals are deserving of punishment. By the same token, it works in the inverse. Some people do actions that will lead to good, and some people do the same actions that invariably lead to harm. And these things are outside of the individual's control. We would tell you that a god ought to judge people based on what is in their control and what they deserve. And we would tell you that the closest approximation of that in this debate is people's intention. I'm going to do three things in a speech. Firstly, briefly on setup. Secondly, on justice. And thirdly, on the impact upon the world itself. Firstly, on setup. Three points of setup. The first thing that we would note is that the God in either world is likely to be judging people and issuing out judgments both in the mortal world and in the afterlife, which is to say that if your God judges you to be good, they might do things like, for instance, you know, help you get a promotion in the real world, but they also might do things like allow you to go to heaven. We think the scope of the debate can uh, encompass all of that. Secondly, just to clarify what both teams have to defend, we think the defense on our side of the house has to be that even in instances where people do very bad things, so long as they believe what they did was good, they would be able to go to heaven. And on their side of the house, it has to be the case that even if someone intended to do something massively wrong and accidentally did good, they would go to heaven. Those are the reasonable extremes that both sides of the house have to defend in this debate. But thirdly, we would point out that the extent of knowledge afforded to both sides of the debate is just that God judges in a certain way, not what God actually believes to be morally good or morally wrong, not what God looks like. Nothing else in this debate is presumed to be knowable. That's significant because later in the debate, we'll explain to you why because you don't know what is actually a good or a bad consequence according to God's judgment, it means it's very likely that you're constantly acting in ways accidentally outside of God's judgment. With that set up out of the way, we'll move on to the first argument about justice. And essentially what this argument will explain to you is that in our world, people get the fairer judgment, and that is by far the more important argument in this debate, for two reasons. Firstly, for the reason that typically when we understand legal interactions in the real world, we trend towards the side of justice rather than the side of outcome which is to say that we could just, you know, jail entire portions of the population and functionally remove crime, but we choose not to do that, even though it might have a net positive outcome for the reason that we believe that justice is the more important arbiter of how we ought to run these things. But secondly, for the reason that on the scale of outcome, if you believe that to be the most important thing, the fact that people are either being sent to heaven for eternity or hell for eternity means that the scale of harm and benefit available to both sides is enormous. And it's best allocated when we're talking about when people are actually sent to the right place or sent to the wrong place, which is why this initial argument, which will explain to you why intent is the better way to decide whether people go to heaven or hell is by far the more important argument in this debate. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of things. And essentially what I'm going to be doing is explaining to you why on the comparative, it is ridiculous to assume that someone based on consequence ought to be sentenced to eternity in heaven and hell, whereas based on intent, it makes a lot more sense. 
what are the metrics on which we would adjudicate this? We think the two most reasonable metrics are controllability and deservability. And what we would note about controllability, as I allude to in my introduction, is so many factors are outside of the individual's control that it is a logical absurdity to say that that person has to be culpable for those actions, both in the positive and in the negative, which is to say, that an individual is constrained not only by the typical structures they can't constrain, like society, like family, like the place in which they were born, but also by the sheer randomness of the world around us. We do not understand the world around us. And even on a molecular atomic level, things happen randomly. A butterfly will flap its wings in Indonesia and a tree will fall down in America. And that is the world in which we live. And what you have to consider is that each individual has almost no access to the information necessary to determine the actual consequence of their outcomes, which is to say that tomorrow I could go out and I could donate $20 to the Red Cross. And the Red Cross could use that $20 to keep someone in a scenario where they were more at danger than not more, than not in, uh, you know, than the comparative. And importantly, they themselves even could not know that. All of this is to say that the actual outcomes of actions are so far outside of what people can actually control that we ought to adjudicate it based on what they believe is the right thing to do and the thoroughness with which they take out that action. They might say on the opposition, well, isn't it the case that people's intentions are also outside of their control? They're shaped by society, they're shaped by impulses, they're shaped by evolution. Wouldn't that also indicate to you that you're judging people based on things they can't control? We would suggest two things in response. The first thing that we would suggest in response is that people can control their impulses and they can control their intent to a far higher extent than they control the actual outcomes of their actions, which is to say that people can do things like lean on community, they can do things like introspect, they can do things like evaluate with their, you know, I would imagine a priest in this world to tell them whether they're doing something that is in intent. And importantly, they have complete access to that information, which is to say they know surely that what they are doing is either something they believe in or they don't believe in, which enables them to better modify that behavior when push comes to shove. But finally, to cap off this argument, even if you don't believe any of that, the problem this opposition has to face is that people could believe, based on the false words of prophets and priests, that a set of actions are the consequences that God wants, and they could be entirely off base. The God could want something completely different, which means he would be functionally damning all of earth for doing things that they believed were good to life and health, which is the reason why on the issue of justice, you ought to side with side affirmative. Let's now move on to the impact on the world, because we think this is where the negative team are going to try to gain a lot of ground. They're going to claim that essentially in a consequentialist world, people are going to do more good things and that will lead to a series of good outcomes. We would note that we're not going to you know, disagree that their side relative to the status quo certainly generates more utility, but we believe our side also is able to claim that. We think there are four reasons, however, to believe that their side of the house does not gain the utility they're likely to claim. Firstly, we think people are likely to adjudicate their consequences according to an arbitrary ethical ledger, which is to say that they're likely to do things like say, well, I did a bad thing yesterday, therefore I ought to do a good thing. And that has two consequences. Firstly, it means that people can better justify doing bad things more often. It means they can do things like, oh, I yelled at my kid, but it's okay because I went to church the next day. Whereas in our world, yelling at your child is always something that's impermissible and you're pushed away from. Importantly, though, secondly, we would note that people are likely to be particularly bad judges of the amount of good they have to do to offset the amount of harm they do. That is for the reason that A, people generally don't have the information to assess how much good and how much harm they have done. But B, people have an inherent optimism bias, which means that they overestimate the amount of good they've done and underestimate the amount of harm they've done. Secondly, we would suggest that competition means that the consequences of people's actions are likely to jar with each other, which is to say that to some extent, good consequences are a zero sum game. Only one person can get credit for them in some instances. And sometimes two people's interpretation of a good consequence can come directly in contrast with one another, which means that people are incentivized in some instances to actively work against another person gaining a good consequence such that they can. And entire nations may work against one another when they have differing beliefs about what good consequences are. Whereas in our world, people are much more likely to be collaborative and they're much more likely to be accepting of various different ways of thinking, maximizing amount of net good that can be done. But finally, we will point out that uh, people, when they are likely to do good consequences, are likely to follow a very narrow strip of good consequences, which is to say that they're likely to do only those that they feel most certain in, rather than those that might actually be most needed. You're more likely to go to church, which you know has a good consequence, rather than going out and feeding the poor, which you know might be riskier. With all of that out of the way, comparatively, in our world, we're able to claim that people can still maximize the good they're able to do because good intentions naturally lead to good actions, while pointing out that all of the existing frameworks for consequences, like, for example, legal systems, societal structure, and uh, pressure from friends and family, all still exist, still pushing people to do good in our world. 
the reason of justice, for the reason of making a better world, vote side affirmative. I'd like to thank the speaker and welcome the first negative speaker to open the case for side negative. All right, I'm um, just making sure that you can hear and see me. Uh, yep, I can hear you, I can see you. Oh, okay, brilliant. Just give me a sec, I'll just set up um, everything and then I'll start. All right, starting in three, two, one. The problem with the AFGAs is as follows. In a prefers a world motion, we ought to talk about the practical impacts of that, but it's not just that, right? We think that the problem is all of their analysis is predicated upon what is moral and which is the more moral framework for God to judge individual actions in. But the problem with that is that we don't know who this God particularly is or what religion this God is from, whether it's a Muslim God or a Christian God, et cetera. This means then what we ought to think about more is how this translates into real life actions that people do in the name of pleasing that God, which means then ultimately in our world right now, we like there may be a like in status quo, Obviously, there isn't a like specific information that people know about how God judges people, but a lot of the divine intervention that's going to happen in your afterlife translates into how you live your life right now, which means then a lot of the things that we ought to focus on are the real world impacts. Uh, a lot of my rebuttals are going to be integrated within a lot of my speech, so I'm just going to go ahead and start. First, let's talk a little bit about religion as a moral value. We think that the problem is religion can be uh, religion is a not exactly a net good or a net bad moral value. We think that it can be good and bad depending on the context that it preaches and depending on what you are being asked to do, which means then a lot of the problematic aspects of religion are actually related to intention, which is be loyal to your God, be loyal to your religion, etc. And you can be as dubious as you want by justifying a lot of things with your tying that back to your loyalty towards God, hence justifying a lot of bad actions in the name of your loyalty towards God. But consequences in general are positive. Don't kill, don't lie, donate, love thy neighbor, etc. All of these are positive consequences that religion has an incentive to make positive because one, they essentially want more followers, but two, they don't want, they essentially don't want to lose individuals' faith. Like they don't want to lose, like, uh, they don't want uh, a lot of individuals to move out of that religion, et cetera. And they don't want communal harms to happen within that community because religion is a largely communal practice. As a result of this, intent can be very fluid, but consequence is very concrete and very visceral. Because if consequences were viscerally bad, people would opt out of religion. And that is why it is religion has an incentive to make sure that the consequences religion talks about is always good. Secondly, which is the community thing, because religion needs to apply to community, consequences are generally positive. Great. So let's talk about why this is like this world is exclusively bad because religious organizations get a lot more control. The premise of this argument is the way this translates to real life is still going to be through actors that presumably have some religious and spiritual connection with the divine, which are religious leaders, spiritual leaders, etc. They are the ones who are going to tell you this is the amount of intent that you need to have in order to suffice going to heaven, etc. Because intent is a very vague metric. And you, in order to understand what specifically is a pure intent or how pure your intent needs to be, you ought to look at somebody and seek some guidance. We think irrational faith by nature is intention. Do you or do you not intend to please God? That is exactly what religious organizations are going to use to make individuals even more irrational. Why? Because when their judgment on how they are as a person is determined by intangible things and not concrete things like consequences, they're likely to be more influenced by religious leaders and other figures of authority that pass down what this judgment is based on. Which is to say then, they are not sure how to make their intentions the most pure or how it can be even more purer which pushes people over the edge. What is the practical outcome of this? We think then it makes, it is easier to make individuals a lot more fundamentalist and extremist in the worst cases. We think that the reason this is 
true is because people by nature, because they're not understanding and they have no concrete way of evaluating specifically how much they are serving God, they become easier to manipulate. And that is what religious organizations in particular tap into. And hence people become more irrational. In the worst case, this means you can be an extremist. You can harm individuals as much as you want by doing the worst atrocities because your intention is correct. And that intention is still to please God. We think that is a much worse world where people can do the worst kind of harms to other communities, but still justify that because presumably your intent was still pure, which was to please God, which can be a lot more manipulated by these religious entities because seemingly consequences don't matter. We think that that is the most important thing versus consequences because it is very tangible and you can see the outcome of your action. You are less likely to be manipulated to the level of that extremity because God judges based on consequences, which means when you do good things, you know, essentially that this is perhaps the right way of acting. We think under us world, people are more manipulated by religious organizations who get a lot more control. That is incredibly bad. Secondly, we think that intentions in particular are very individualized, which means, and it is an, it is an extension of the previous analysis, but in a different context. We think that the problem is in your day-to-day -day interactions, you only think about what you are trying to do and you do not consider the harm that it poses on another individuals. Things like trying to pressurize your agnostic friend to convert, for instance. Things like asking your LGBTQ uh, friend to not sort of like, uh, to, to sort of reconsider, et cetera, because they are probably displeasing God. All of this is hurtful to the individual that you're interacting with, but you wouldn't care in those interactions because to you, your intention is pure. The problem with individuals is we don't have a lot of capacity perhaps to self-introspect or understand specifically. This is even worse, where you can justify everything based on intention. As long as you can justify to yourself that my intention was pure, I only intended on making sure that this person follows God's way. You can literally, you are justified in acting however you want to because there's no tangible outcome or you don't even consider the tangible outcome of this. This means then it not only translates to individual relationships, but also to communities. What exactly is your incentive to help us less privileged people if consequences behind making someone else's life better is not something that is going to be used as a moral metric to judge you in God's eyes. We are not sure why that incentive is still something that is going to apply. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about internal guilt. We think individuals by and large are less fulfilled under AF's world. This is because, and this is direct engagement to the idea of impact, because what AF tells us is essentially that you are going to do more bad things in number because you can offset them by doing good things. We don't think the calculation works that way because even though you know that God is going to judge your consequence, you're not entirely sure which consequence of yours has how much moral value attached to it. As a result of that, you cannot be sure as to which specific consequence has the most amount of impact in your going to heaven. This is why, and presumably afterlife is a good, like is a very important driving factor for individuals. We think you're going to be incentivized towards doing as many good things as possible because ultimately what is going to count is the consequences of your actions. That is why things like giving more, more donations, et cetera, is something that we can exclusively get because you're going to try to make as many people ha as happy as possible because you're trying to have more tangible consequences of your actions, which means then under our world, presumably there are more good things. But under AF's world, this is worse. But also the problem is religious individuals by and large are less fulfilled because nothing makes them happy because they're not unsure as to how much good deeds they have done in God's eyes. The last thing that I want to say before capping my speech, consequences by large better because consequences in general can evolve over time, but the intent stays static, which is your intent ought to be to please God. But the way to judge consequences, et cetera, change over time, which means according to the evolution of organized religion and the way in which social practices become a lot more liberalized, et cetera, consequences is something that evolves over time with that. And the way God judges that also ought to evolve over time versus the intent remaining static, which is just to please God. At the end of my speech, I've shown to you that because religious organizations get more control, because uh, like intention is more individualized, you cause worse harm, incredibly proud to negate. Thank you. I'd like to thank the speaker for their speech and welcome the second affirmative speaker to continue the case for side affirmative.
Uh, sorry, just checking that I'm audible. Yep, I can hear you. Awesome. Okay, starting my speech in three, two, one. I'll talk about three things in this speech. Firstly, eternal justice. Secondly, psychic suffering. And finally, altruism. Firstly, on eternal justice. And the reason why I'm beginning with this issue is because it is vastly the most important one in the debate, but also the one which sadly has received almost no response from the negative team. We explain that intentions are what should dictate a just form of moral judgment on the basis of which it would be just to send someone to heaven or to hell or to punish them in this life or not. We explain that intentions are far more controllable, that luck is something which impacts consequences, as does privilege, as does every other factor in the world, other people over which you have no control. So it is deeply immoral to punish people on the basis of those consequences rather than intent, which is far more so individually controllable. And we also explain that it's particularly immoral that God would give you circumstances which are outside of your control and then punish you for the things which arise in your life as a result of those circumstances. The one we response we get to this is an attempt to devalue this issue by saying, well, you don't know what sort of God they'll be. They could be a Christian. They should be Muslim. So we should devalue this argument about cosmic justice. Clearly, that is a reason why we should care about intention rather than consequences, because it's true that a Muslim God and a Christian God probably have different ideas about what kind of consequence is good. But we think on both sides, you can to a pretty significant degree suggest that intention is something that can be measured. And note that basically all gods, in fact, I would say all like, Almost all religions or most religions believe in an afterlife or some kind of thing, you know, after the end of, of our lives, or at the very least, all uh, gods have the capacity to like put judgment on people, to punish people in this life or the next, to reward them in this life or the next for things they have done. And you cannot understate the importance of this argument because the negative team would condemn people to hell on the basis of things which are morally arbitrary. Note that that is a consequentialist argument. We are saying billions and billions of people will suffer forever for things that are outside of their moral control. Clearly, that wins us the debate. And clearly, that is worse than any kind of slightly worse political outcomes in our world at the moment, which is the only thing that this negative team potentially has to stand on. The second thing I'm going to do is to talk about psychic suffering, which is a new piece of substantive I will be advancing in this debate. I think that this negative team consigns people to an extraordinarily degree, just high degree of uncertainty and pain. And that is because it is very hard to be sure of the net goodness of your deeds for reasons that are, I think, actually conceded by the first negative speaker and for reasons that Ollie gives you. You don't know how other people will respond to what you do such that you don't understand how consequences will stack up. You don't know what the flow of history will be after you die. And note that we have conflicting accounts of good deeds between different people, cultures, and sects in a way that makes you very unsure of what's going to happen. On our side, we explain that you can be way more sure of your intentions. And I'm to explain here that this kind of contentment or certainty on our side doesn't cancel out your desire to do better because you only get this contentment when you are sure that your intentions are pure, right? So that is exactly the kind of thing which leads you to be more altruistic in the future. But the impact then I think is huge. It means there's a huge degree of suffering which you give people on neg when people live in anguish, when they're unsure whether they will be damned to hell or admitted to heaven. And the second thing which note directly responds to the first negatives material about exploitation is that you are in fact, far vulnerable to far more vulnerable to exploitation by evil religious figures or by you know oppressive doctrine when they you are less sure of your salvation. So you're more likely to turn to your priest or your imam or the doctrine of your particular religion to give you that sense of salvation. You're more likely to be vulnerable and exploited by religious actors who bad bad intentions when you are not sure in yourself that you are saved by God and you don't need to give money to that particular televangelist or whatever. That is why it's far better on our side. This negative team is unjust and they must contend with this as a consequentialist harm and so far vastly the biggest impact in this debate. Next then though on the only leg they have left to stand on which is about altruism in our world. Their claim is that consequences are black and white and intention is vague and so therefore it's easier to persuade people to do bad things on the basis of caring about intention. Firstly, that is not true for all the many reasons we give you at Ollie, which get no direct response. We explain that it's actually incredibly difficult to measure outcome and it's easy to justify bad consequences on the basis of their metric because people have a certainty bias, which means they're gonna avoid things that might actually have good consequences into the future. So for instance, people are unlikely to support like revolutionary movements, for instance, which might actually be incredibly 
incredibly important if everyone got behind them, but because you think it's unlikely that I as an individual note that this is about individual impact, or at least it is in the conception we hear from that speech, are less likely to support that. We understand that competition is something that undermines, uh, that means that you're likely to like undermine other people's attempts to achieve that outcomes, that often people have the wrong information and optimism bias, which is why it is not true that you can correctly correct, uh, that you can correctly assess that kind of outcome. But I would say secondly, that it is not true that intentions are more dubious. I think intentions are far more universal than an assessment of what makes good consequences. And this is, I think, an intuition pump, which I think is pretty plausible, right? People basically cross-culturally agree that things like kindness, like goodness, like honesty, purity, virtue, whatever, are good. Obviously, there is some disagreement within cultures, but compare that to the disagreement across what kind of consequences are good. See cultures that have justified slavery and colonization, murder of people of a different race to you. Clearly, those are things which are vastly more different, vastly more able to, to make people vulnerable to doing those kind of bad things. And note that this negative team gives you some reasons why there is perhaps a potential opportunity for people to do wrong, but they give you no reason or mechanization as to how a focus on intention pushes you there other than an assertion that those intentions are vague. And I would note finally that obviously on our side, we can still have like commandments and religious doctrine that specify the kind of intentions that are good. Our claim is just that intentions that are seen to be good are vastly more homogenous than outcome. People have justified slavery. They need to contend with that. But the second thing I'm going to say, which are our two other ways we overcome this argument. The first is material we give you at Oli, which gets no response from the first negative speaker, which suggests that intentions, that focusing on intentions leads to good outcomes anyway. And that's firstly, because pure intention involves usually a consideration of consequence. So for instance, a pure intention might be something like diligence, like care for others in a way that means your consequences are likely to be good. But secondly, that good consequences are held in place by other structures and incentives. That is things like the law, the things like the fact that your consequences are visible to other people who are going to hold you to account for them, whereas intentions are a very private thing. So comparatively, we get a way bigger benefit on this issue because their metric of good consequences is served by other stuff in society. The next claim we make then, and the other way we get over that, is to suggest that people can try and trade off good and bad deeds in their world, which is to say, maybe you do something, uh, you know, bad, but you can just do, you know, 10 good things later to get on top of that. And I would note additionally that this is also very much aligned with privilege, right? Like maybe you're a horrible person, but because you have a lot of money, you're able to just donate to lots of charities, get over that. That is a privilege-based mechanism, which they have to cop. First negative says, well, you're going to be uncertain about the size of consequences. So you're going to just try and default to doing the maximum amount of good all the time. That is rebutted, I think, by our analysis about the fact that it's very difficult to determine, or people rather, have a bias in favor of the consequences they put forward being good, right? So you're more likely to be... Um, you know, comfortable with that in some instances, but we would say in other instances, this is where my piece of substantive comes in, which is to suggest that it's probably quite bad to constantly be in pain and uncertainty where you're unsure of the consequences you put forward. As I explain in substantive, it's unlikely that just being content with knowing that you're going to go to heaven makes you like do bad things because the necessary precondition for that is having pure intentions. That's why altruism is way better on our side, but more importantly, people don't go to hell for things that they don't deserve to. That is why we win. Thank the speaker for their speech and welcome the second negative speaker to continue the case for side negative. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. To framing to start this speech. First, the reason why justice and fairness is a metric that can be weighed really strongly in criminal justice debates is because there's certainty of those actions, like sending people to prison, being materialized in the real world, which is why fairness in the process of it is a principle we ought to protect. The problem is whether or not God even exists has no scientific proof, and whether or not these people will have eternal damnation is something that is speculative. Based on that, 
the real world consequences of what people believe is significantly more important than the fairness through which either of these metrics is true. That's the first thing I'd like to posit. The second thing I'd like to posit is there's unchallenged um, characterization that exists on First Neck about the way in which religious organizations have framed intentions and have framed consequences. The way they frame intention is to establish loyalty and take away uh, idea, like, you know, the idea of good things by making sure you're loyal to your leader, loyal to your religion, and keeping it intentionally vague so that they can weaponize that for control. The reason why they can't do this with consequences is because number one, the idea of consequences are far more visceral. So if they start selling the fact that they want visceral negative consequences, people opt out of religion by virtue of the humanity within us. Number two, they want to establish communities and incrementally reach out to people. So they want to create social harmony, which is why they want good things like love thy neighbor rather than good intentions in the process of loving thy neighbor. Um, also, thirdly, and an additional reason is the way religion evolves is one where they have to cave to political demands of the modern day based on consequences. So things like legalizing gay marriage is a consequence that religion needs to accept as time progresses because it still wants to appeal to its population. So there are ways in which you can also change what consequences are fair and what consequences are not. But often the intention of pleasing God in the process is something that is imper like impermeable and is permanent throughout. These two pieces of framing prove the entire affirmative case is redundant because the only things that matter are the consequences that our first neck talked about in her speech. Let's assume the best case of affirmative. Yeah, it's really unfair to think about the ways in which um, intention is materialized because it's random. You can't like put someone in eternal damnation through randomness. Five, I think, responses to this. Number one, let's look at a comparison of randomness within intention and a comparison of randomness within consequences, right? I think the randomness of consequences comes from accident, like, you know, unintentionally, you know, I don't know, spitting on the road and hitting someone or accidentally putting out a particular action that ends up hurting someone or saying something you never wanted to actually hurt someone through. But the problem is these are by virtue of actions which humans do on a smaller scale every day. Intentions come from thoughts and come from a perpetual cycle through which we are continuously involved. There's no point in time in our conscious day that we stop thinking. The reason why this is important is the randomness in thoughts comes from randomnesses of triggers to those thoughts. I would posit that it's far harder to control what you think about when you see something randomly, you have to consciously tell yourself to stop thinking what you're thinking and not carry out a particular action. But the thing before that, which is stopping the thought altogether, it's far more difficult. Why is this important? This is because randomness of intention has lots of guilt for you as an individual as well. So the fact that you see a white person who may or may not be from a community that oppresses you and you want to murder them by virtue of the fact of their skin color, it's something you genuinely may feel guilty about, but you can't control. And this is because of biology, because of your socioeconomic circumstances and a lot of other things beyond your control. Number two, um, I would posit that it is also easier to control an accident the moment it has happened once. So you're consciously aware of the consequences of your actions and you avoid the repetition of that in the same time. But it's far harder to control your thoughts. That's why mental health is such a complicated topic that most of us haven't figured out the science to and we don't often have control over our own mental health as well. Number three, who are likely to create negative consequences and who are likely to have negative intentions? The people who are likely to create negative consequences are likely to be privileged people. Like I unintentionally hurt a minority or I unintentionally hurt an EFL speaker by saying something in a debate. But someone who's likely to have negative thoughts is a victim, which is this person has oppressed me and I feel like I want to slap him because of his father's actions or his mother's actions. So as a comparison of vulnerability, we ought to protect those who are victims by virtue of lottery of birth rather than those who are privileged in terms of fairness. Number four, we think the scale of harm of an accident versus the scale of harm of an intention that doesn't care about consequences is something you ought to compare. So maybe I accidentally hurt someone, but if I'm not thinking about that someone at all in my calculus, my ability to hurt them is significantly higher, something that they absolutely did not respond to on first neck. Lastly, it's not just about negative consequences. It's also about the good feelings that you have within you. Maybe you want to donate to people and maybe, yeah, they accept that we get good donations and you know, more good activities on our side. So we win that utility as well. But the problem is even if you have good donations or some level of good activities on their side, you continuously question yourself. 
Am I doing this for selfish reasons to go to heaven? Or do I genuinely care about this individual and want to reach out and help them? All of those reasons make it far more difficult for them to even internalize good actions. And they use up a lot of sun time in thinking about it or end up not doing it. The only other thing they say is, ah, but even if these good consequences are created, there'll be a narrow strip of good consequences. The first reason why this is untrue is, no, there's an active incentive of leaders to maximize good consequences so they have more followers. So they'll likely frame it as a not a zero sum game so more people can do like play a part in it. So all of your donations made this mosque rather than one person is an active incentive of a leader to do because they want more followers. Number two, there's no reason for you to break down power dynamics as a privileged individual unless this incentive to think about the consequences of your action actually materializes. The only thing left from their side is we stop revolutionary movements. I posit that the best revolutionary movements happen through empathy. Why is empathy something that is stopped on their side? The, why, the reason why empathy is something that we have in the modern day is because you often think about the perspective of another individual in your moral calculations. So my action and that impact on another person is something you consciously think about from their perspective. The nature of intention is one where you no longer have to think from an alternative perspective, but only think from a soulless perspective of yourself. This naturally means your ability to understand other individuals and their needs becomes less prevalent, and you only think about selfish intentions and what benefits you or people close to you. Number two, there's also an incentive for leaders to define this and shape this. And the reason is because it's easy to be charismatic and sway what the intention of yours should be, rather than be charismatic and hide visceral consequences of what your actions create. All of this means that the moment you think only from yourself, you're less likely to be empathetic to the other side and more likely to be selfish. The first impact this does is directly engage to affirmative side of you know, revolutionary movements and change. The reason you will change for good is because you care about others and how that change benefits them. You might still have revolution in your side, but this revolution is likely to be one which only comes from individual thoughts and selfish intentions. This is something that religious leaders weaponize very powerfully for extremism. Step-by-step -step process. Number one, when you're a victim of a particular action and you only think about yourself, you often forget the existing world and you often only care about the next world. That's why jihad is justified because you care about the consequences less. Number two, you also are promised salvation through this action. Um, it's not 8.15 yet, it's 8.5. So this is why this salvation is also something that you can get. Very glad to negate. Um, hope all of that was in common. Right, I'd like to speak for their speech and welcome the third affirmative speaker to continue the case for side affirmative. Okay, uh, can I give a, get a quick audio check? Uh, yep, I can hear you. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Oh, all right, starting my speech in three, two, one. This is a debate dramatically lacking clarity. And so I'm gonna start this speech by clarifying two things. The first one is that presumed within the motion, which requires teams to consider how God would judge people in their entrance to the afterlife or in their you know, acquisition of blessings, clearly the existence of God and the existence of the afterlife are presumed by the debaters. And so any consideration of religion and any consideration of the afterlife should be evaluated as we have described. But the second and more complex thing I want to clarify is the distinction between a thought or a feeling as that speech was largely about and an intention. Because what would we would point out is that a thought or a feeling, as they say, is fleeting, it's abstract, and it's not associated with any moral decision or moral consideration. But that's exactly what distinguishes an intention. An intention is associated with a decision, a decision to behave in a certain way, a decision to value certain things, a decision to approach a situation in a particular way. And that distinction is critical for the way you should evaluate this debate. Because to take, to take their example of sexiness, 
they're hot might be a feeling you have or a thought you've experienced. But we say the intention that happens in that scenario is your intent when you go to talk to them. This debate is not about fleeting thoughts and fleeting feelings or your overall life philosophy and the way you decide to live your life. But even if you think those fleeting thoughts and fleeting emotions are within the scope of an intention, clearly the overall way you live your life is the much grander or larger intention which would outweigh the consideration by that second negative speaker. I think that provides the foundation for why we will win this debate. And I'm going to explain it in three issues. Firstly, I'm gonna ask who deserves to go to heaven. Secondly, I'm gonna think about who does more better, who does good in the world. And finally, we'll think about cosmic certainty. Let's start with who deserves to go to heaven. The big question here is what should the criteria be for entrance into heaven? And we give you something very simple from first. We say people who have tried their hardest to do the right thing and who believe that they are doing pure things and with pure intentions deserve to go to heaven. And we explain that to you over two metrics. The first thing we'd said is that effort and what you can control is a much fairer metric than things that are outside of your control. And the second thing we explained is that this does not require a particular system of thinking or beliefs like the evaluation of consequences does, which is why this does not prohibit people who've been manipulated or indoctrinated and are by any account a victim from going to heaven. What do we get from this side? We get a few things. The first thing is, the first set of criteria comes at first. And it's just about doing good in the world. Obviously, no engagement with the degree of control you have of the amount of good you do in the world. No engagement with the fact that some people simply cannot do much good in the world. A couple of better attempts come at second. The first claim we get from second speaker is an attempt to outweigh our argument by pushing against the notion that the afterlife is the eternal harm or benefit of this debate by saying that, well, in the real world, we don't know if God exists and we don't know if the afterlife exists. Obviously, as I clarified in my introduction, for the purposes of this debate, we know both of those things for certain. And that has massive ramifications for this debate because it means the clarity and the fairness of the criteria for entrance into heaven is by far the biggest impact in this debate because it determines the fate of everyone forever not some people living on earth at one given time. The better attempt to outweigh this argument is to say that thoughts are not, already, are not always within your control. The first thing we did though, is preempt this right from first to no response. The way that you can control, particularly your bigger thoughts or intentions through things like introspection or leaning on your community or leaning on religious leaders. But secondly, this is also the thing that can be accounted for within the broader spectrum of your pure intentions, which is to say the thoughts which are not in your control, if you're actively trying to fight against them, at least some of the time, and your overall philosophy is one which is pure, that is clearly still a fairer metric, even though there's a few things which are outside of your control, than one where the consequences are the only thing you can rely upon. And those things are far more fluid and far harder to, to deal with. Thirdly, we'd posit that if we're simply talking about thoughts, which everyone experiences, like, oh, that person's attractive, but I'm in a relationship, that's exactly the type of thing that could be accounted for under our side of the house and not a meaningful determinant of who goes to heaven or, go, or who goes to hell. But the final thing we explained, as I alluded to in my introduction, is that addressing an intent is not the same as addressing a thought or a feeling. At the end of this first issue, I want to reflect on what this debate requires you to do because it requires a substantial exercise in imagination if you are not always, if you're not anyways religious. And we're the only team which is engaged in that exercise in imagination. Explaining to you why heaven or hell and where people go is the biggest impact in the debate. And then explaining why intentions by and large are the fairest way to determine or, or fairest way to make that decision. But now let's move on to the ways that the negative team has tried to run away from that argumentation. The first way they've done it is by trying to explain that they do more good in the world. Let's deal with all of this. At first, they just say good consequences are easily measurable. But we at second completely defeat that when we say that clearly religion does not always provide an account of what good consequences are in line with what we think good consequences actually are, because religion has been used to justify violence and slavery. The better account of this comes at second, where they say, well, bad consequences have visceral negative emotions associated with them. And so people will acknowledge eventually that those are bad consequences. But we would note that that exact mechanism also applies to our side of the house. Because when your bad intentions, so to speak, lead you to do bad things, then those negative consequence, consequences would be equally visceral. And there's no reason why we, we would think that that's untrue. And so to the degree their people are willing to question the actual concrete foundations of what is good, which their interpretation of religion has led them to believe, we would say that that visceral negative emotion would be sufficient to leave people to question their intentions and their interpretation of what is best in the world. 
Second negative gives us a few more things. The next thing they say is in response to our competition, war and revolution material, or just the competition and war stuff, is this idea that you want to leave good for others to do or facilitate others doing good so that they can join you in heaven and you can be an effective religious leader. Three responses. Firstly, obvious this, obviously this only replies to, applies to religious leaders and individuals who do not have a necessary incentive to help other people get to heaven, or by virtue of being humans, falsely do not account for the fact that they might be able to do good by helping other people get into heaven, are unlikely to be subject to this, so all of our mechanisms there. Secondly, we'd even ask for religious leaders whether they'd be willing to gamble their spot in heaven by allowing other people to do good, which they could otherwise be doing. Sure, you might say, well, you know, they're elitist, they might do this, but in the context of eternity in pleasure or eternity in pain, we're not so sure. More characterization required. But finally, we would also know that even if you don't believe either of those things, and we're only talking about religious leaders, the ability to show off the amount of good you do and role model it is just as plausible of a characterization as to why people would behave selfishly and not collaborate in the way they do good in the world. So all of the explanation we give you, particularly at Sophie, about why people would contest with each other and make altruism charity inefficient stand. The final contention we get from the negative then is about revolution. And they say, well, intentions are often selfish, whereas consequences are not. But we would point out that the intention to do good, for instance, is obviously not selfish. And although people might be concerned with the intentions they have, we would also know that people would be aware of the fact that they are not acting on those intentions or they do not have a actually pure intention if their main intention is to keep their like kind of first level intentions in check, if that makes sense. Basically, if their only consideration is, are my intentions good, then they are probably aware that they are being selfish and that that is not a good intention. No reason why people wouldn't be able to do that with a lifetime of thinking. Finally, cosmic certainty and psychic power. No response to this from the other team. And I think it's incredibly important because the impact of this argument is the greatest form of emotional happiness that is available to individuals. There's a feeling that you are at least doing the right thing. It also explains why we are able to avoid the worst forms of suffering under our side of the house because people are at least aware that their life will be able to get better in the afterlife. For all of those reasons, vote for side of Hi, um, I see that someone said that they didn't want to stream. Um, is this the upcoming speech? Yes, yeah, yeah. All right, so let me just stop live streaming then. Still the recording. Yeah, the recording is in progress, so Sajid can start. Great, whenever you're ready. Just a sec. Lost my my speech in three, two, one. There are three concrete harms that materialize in the real world that went unengaged to. The first is an explanation of how this makes people irrational. And that irrationality comes from thinking from a selfish perspective and also the incentive of religious leaders to weaponize that selfishness and tie intention to their moral calculus that they, did them, that they decide. This pushes people towards Ir like irrational actions that any religious leader can justify. This ranges on a spectrum from being selfish in the way in which they interact and weaponize power of privileged individuals. This also translates to extremism where people start thinking in the name of God and what their religious leader will be happy through and harming other minority communities in the process. The second piece of framing that we talked about was how this internalization, even if um, it's not about harms, but the fact that you always have negative intentions and if you're blamed for it, it's something that people internalize through guilt. And this is because this is something that they can control far less and it's far more random and the triggers are every day and it's a continuous process. 
And this is a sizable group of people that continuously and perpetually feel guilty about being bad human beings. The third thing we talked about was the ways in which this also manifests to good actions and why those good actions are less valuable on their world because you always question the intentions behind those good actions and whether or not those were something you truly wanted. And in our work, it just maximizes the incentive of powerful people to break down privilege and reach out to communities they otherwise would not because the degree to which they help um, was the way in which this, uh, their, their moral judgment would happen. This is a belief, by the way, and we tied all of this with two pieces of framing. Number one, there will always be a desire to do good consequences rather than good intentions. And this is because the way in which consequences are explained in religion are generally more positive. And this is because they, one, are more visceral, two, are more communal, and three, have an incentive to always develop and play a part in modern society, so they evolve. Intentions are not valuable, and they're far more vague, and they weaponize the vulnerable, uh, they weaponize religious leaders and their interpretation of it. All of this proves that there is an incentive, the consequences that people, if they want to pers pursue it, are likely to be good consequences, and they're incentivized towards them. The negative consequences come as a result of negative intention, which is the bedrock of that framing. This framing went unchallenged. It was put in first negative, it was repeated in second and third negative and developed better with absolutely no response. This is the bedrock of any material and potentially debate breaking. They needed to respond to this to have a chance in the debate. We then moved on to a more powerful piece of framing. We said, this is probably the most important part of the debate. The vast majority of the affirmative case doesn't even fall under this spectrum. And the reason is because they're debating on fairness. The reason why this is significantly less important in the debate is because fairness would be a metric if the act outcomes were concrete of that action. But there's no guarantee of heaven and hell in the motion. And the only thing the motion guarantees is the belief that exists on either side, not the existence of what that belief like is about, right? And since that existence is not scientifically proven, it is not something that can be weighed as more important than something that is guaranteed in the real world. Even if this is the metric you judge the debate through, and I really hope panel that you don't. We gave you five or six sets of responses on why judging based on intention is far more perverse and more unfair. Number one, we compared the degree of randomness and why it's higher when it comes to intention. Number two, we talked about the degree on your ability to control intention and why it's less. Uh, number three, we talked about who are likely to have negative intentions and who are likely to have negative consequences and why more vulnerable groups are the ones that end up with negative intentions. Number four, we talked about accidents, the scale of harm of those accidents and compared it to the accidents that are non-accidental harms that are created. And number five, we also talked about good outcomes and the way in which they need to be weighed. There is no metric through which affirmative case stands, even if it does, the responses we've given clearly break all of it down. Very glad to clearly win. Next speaker and welcome the affirmative reply speaker to conclude this debate. I wanna start with the simplest piece of material in this debate. People can't control the consequence of the actions, they can control their intent. Therefore, sending them to hell based on the actions that they have done that they had no control over is deeply immoral and causes an enormous consequentialist harm. The opposition throughout their bench choose different ways to respond. At first, they choose not to respond. At second, they choose to claim that God is not actually presumed to be true in the motion, at which point we explain that it is a presumed truth of the motion based on the wording, and that it is only finally at third negative that we hear the explanation that even if we presumed God exists, we would not necessarily presume heaven or hell exists. And therefore, this argument prima facie cannot be employed to which we have actually preemptively dealt with down the bench. The first thing that we would note is that the affirmative team in debates have reasonable definitional fear, which is to say we have scope to say likely what the scope of the debate looks like, and the negative team has an opportunity to respond in their substantive speeches by challenging that definition. Third affirmative is certainly too late to do so, because it does not give us as the affirmative team, third negative rather, as the affirmative team, the ability to fully reply. For instance, by saying things like, well, there is a large chance that heaven or hell exists if a God exists, given that those two ideas are concretely connected, and thereby we ought to defer to the side of caution in this debate. Secondly, we would note that the idea of judgment in the motion would suggest to you that heaven and hell exist, which is to say, if God is not judging based on where to send you in the afterlife, 
God is only then judging based on completely arbitrary and meaningless things. And the point of God's judgment does not actually have any impact in this debate, thus providing more evidence for why the motion presumes a heaven or hell. But thirdly, we would point out that even if you don't buy that, this argument still applies to all the other forms of judgment that can exist in the debate. Like, for example, God striking down a country. Like, for example, God lifting someone out of poverty. All the other kinds of consequentialist impacts that an all-powerful God might be able to impose still occur, which means that this argument still has the consequentialist value we suggested it did from first. All their other responses either rely on misunderstandings of the wording or they rely on tricks of wording. Which is to say, they initially insist that, well, for instance, drunk drivers did not intend to kill someone, therefore they could not be punished. But they did intend to get in a vehicle while drunk while aware of the consequences of that action, which would suggest to you that it is an intent that can be judged, as we suggest from first. Secondly, they tell us that people have malicious thoughts, particularly vulnerable people, and it's wrong to punish them based on those thoughts. Not engaging with the fact that if those thoughts are not attached to an action, as we explained, they cannot be considered an intent, or if they are attached to an action that they do take out, there's no reason provided why this negative team, why just because someone is vulnerable does not mean they ought not be punished for doing something horrible. But finally, they finally suggest, perhaps in tension with their other material, that good intentions can carry victimization as well. Which leads me to the second half of this debate, which is by far the least important half of this debate, the debate about consequences. Because essentially all of their arguments boil down to one claim. Their argument is just that intents can be manipulated and consequences cannot, which leads to people doing bad things in the name of intent of their God. And the only metric they give you by which that is possible is measurability. You can see the outcomes of consequences, you cannot see the outcomes of intents. Of course, we point out that the outcome of intents are in fact consequences and thereby they're equally measurable. And we additionally point out that intents can be laid down in scripture in the same way that consequences can. So this debate is symmetric on those regards. We're not denying that people can be manipulated, merely that consequences can also be manipulated. And in fact, their logic about jihad in the example provided is in fact self-revealing of that, which is to say that the example provided is one in which people are murdering as a good consequence. They believe that murder to be good, which is why their argument falls apart at the seams. And you need to weigh all of their positive material about incentivizing people to do good against the volumes of responses we provide down the bench by pointing out that the ethical ledger exists, meaning that people often can justify negative actions in their world by pointing out that compared competitive uh, consequentialism leads to people getting over the top of each other and actively fighting over those outcomes. And by pointing out that the kinds of good things people will do will be influenced in such a way that they can be manipulated, like the negative says, into ways of certainty bias or, for instance, in ways that support a false profit. This debate is not as complicated as the negative team made it sound. We don't want to send kids who never had the opportunity to do something good to heaven to hell. And that is why we are proud to affirm. So I'd like to thank both teams for the debate. Um, um, John, can I ask a yeah. question? Um, yeah. to, because this room is recording right now, we can record OAs as well, and we've recorded a few. Do you want us to record your OA? Do you, will you consent to that, or should I stop it? Sure, I'm, I'm done with it. All right, so I'll pause the recording now.